Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for your commitment to this very important week. I'm so glad you're here. As I think of our theme, the courage to lead, I'm reminded that there's no higher priority in our mission than improved student learning, supported by quality teaching. But it's your leadership that makes the difference. Effective leaders, effective teachers. I'd like to thank you for what you do every day, for everyone, in every way. You are simply, simply the best teachers in the world. Our next speaker this morning has become an important part of our Leon County School support system as we rise to meet the challenges of change. And it is my privilege to introduce him to you today. Dr. Robert Marzano is executive director of the Learning Sciences Marzano Center for Teacher and Leadership Evaluation. He is a nationally recognized researcher in education, a nationally renowned speaker, trainer, and author of more than 30 books and 150 articles on topics such as instruction, assessment, writing and implementing standards, cognition, effective leadership, and school intervention. His books include, among others, District Leadership That Works, School Leadership That Works, Making Standards Useful in the Classroom, The Art and Science of Teaching, Effective Supervision, and most recently, Becoming a Reflective Teacher. Dr. Mozano's practical translations of the most current research and theory into classroom strategies are internationally known and widely practiced by both teachers and administrators. He received a bachelor's degree from Iona College in New York, a master's degree from Seattle University, and a doctorate from the University of Washington. He is also CEO of Marzano Research Laboratory and Executive Director of Marzano Regional Educational Laboratory Central. Dr. Marzano believes that great teachers develop great students. The Marzano teacher evaluation model has been adopted and recommended by states like Florida, Oklahoma, and Washington as well as countless school districts across the country. Because it doesn't just measure teacher ability, it helps teachers to get better, improving their instruction over time. Dr. Marzano has partnered with Learning Sciences International to provide both the Marzano teacher evaluation model and his new Marzano school leadership evaluation model, two complementary evaluation systems that may be used with the iObservation technology platform for seamless integration. Our Leon County Assessment and Development System, or LEADS, is based on the work of Dr. Marzano. We've just completed our first year with LEADS for teachers, the LEADS leadership model for school principals will be implemented this year. At this time, I would like to direct your attention to the projection screens. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me as we give a warm Leon County welcome to Dr. Robert Marzano. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Can you hear me? How about that? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. Appreciate that. Uh, my name is Bob Marzano. A little bit about myself. Um, I was a classroom teacher. Started in 1968 in an all-boys vocational high school 
in New York City. Had no idea what I was doing, absolutely. Um, in those days, I had no preparation, uh, never taken a methodology course. In those days, you can get a licensure in New York if you passed a test and had a bachelor's degree. And to pass the test, basically had to fog a mirror, which is about all I could do in those days. And uh, they just loved teaching, but just got cream in my first year. Do you know what a permanent sub is? Do you have permanent subs here? You know what those are? That's red meat is what that is, I'll tell you. I mean, I got crucified, somehow made it through that first year. Just got fascinated with the whole art and science of teaching, hence the title. Uh, got way late a little bit. I got interested in the researchy part of our profession kind of early and went to university for ba advanced degree. Uh, became a consultant, so you can say I fell off the wagon here, uh, the, uh, uh, and written books and done research about teaching for years now. Uh, about five years ago, uh, I was making a presentation uh, in New Orleans at an ASCD conference, and a person came up, a little bit younger than I, uh, and he said, I was in one of your first classes. You know, I think his name was Glenn Lutz. So it was kind of interesting when you meet somebody from your past like that, especially when you're a teacher, they're a student, you fall into that teacher-student relationship, interaction type of thing. And he says, you know, he was a principal now. He says, you know, I really like some of the things that you had to say here. He says, no offense though, you weren't very good. And I said, I know. That's we were thinking there's got to be a book you can read, and that's why I ended up doing this. Um, I can tell you one thing. Uh, I've never seen, since so 1968, that's 42 years. I've never seen, no, got that wrong, that's 44 years, right? Yeah. Uh, I've never seen it like this in terms of the changes that are occurring right now. You know, and Superintendent Cavallo hit it right in the, you know, nail right in the head in many cases. You know, it is here. It's not going to go away, these changes. So learn how to surf, really. And I think what you're doing in terms of teacher evaluation and super uh, uh, administrator um, evaluation is look at that as surfing. You know, it's going to change no matter what. The question is what will the change look like and who's going to be in control of that change. Now, nah, that's the good news and the bad news. You can be in control. The bad news is right now it doesn't feel like that. I'm sure you get up many mornings and say, why did I pick this profession, right? What the heck was I thinking? You know, I could have been a lawyer like my sister-in-law or a stockbroker, that type of thing. Um, well, actually, from a logical perspective, maybe you really did pick a good profession. Um, you know, when you get in your mid to late 60s like I am, you start reading things about human happiness and human satisfaction. Uh, you know, and there's actually quite a bit of research on this. About eight years ago, Time Magazine did a whole issue on what makes people happy, particularly at the end of their lives. Um, and uh, again, considerable amount of research and theory in this, I didn't even realize it. Uh, and they started with some naive con conceptions at first, and that is the people who are the most satisfied at the end of the li their lives are people who've done the exciting things in life. How many have seen The Bucket List? Remember the movie The Bucket List? Kind of like that, that theory. You go out and walk the Great Wall and drive the fast cars and ski the slopes, et cetera, et cetera. That was the original thinking which they jettisoned very quickly in terms of people being satisfied at the end of their lives. Here's why. They found out if you lead a life where you're looking for the next exciting thing to do, you end up on what they call the hedonic treadmill. Hedonism, hedonic. And my wife's a psychotherapist, you know, great psychotherapist. She would say, it's the basis of addiction. So if I lead a life you know, where I seek exciting things to do, and I do something exciting today, this is pretty exciting right here, uh, what do I have to do tomorrow to get the same charge? more of what I did today. Can you see where I'm going? My wife would say, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's drugs, alcohol, you name it, it's all about, addiction's all about doing something to kind of medicate you from reality. So if it's not that, then what is it? What is satisfaction? What is the life led in such a way that you come to the end and you say, that was a good ride, that was a great ride. Well, there's a lot of theories, but the one I like the best is by DC and Ryan. They're two cognitive psychologists. Here's what they say about the satisfied life. They say, to lead a satisfied life, you have to do three things. And I'd like you to think of the profession you chose in terms of these three things. Number one, you have to pick something that is very, very difficult and get very good at it. Did you pick a good profession? You bet you did. Can you remember your first days of teaching? What you were thinking? Didn't it go something like, what the heck was I thinking? How could anybody be good at this? And if you're an administrator, can you remember your first days of being an administrator? You were good in the classroom, and then you picked this new profession. 
And you thought, what the heck am I th was I thinking here? I was making it there, and now this is very, very difficult. So, number one, pick something very difficult and get very good at it. Now, it's harder to remember, you know, uh, easy to remember what you were thinking the first days, however, harder to remember when you got up in the morning and started to think, I'm getting good at this. And there was a certain sense, sense of pride that you had, which doesn't go away as long as you keep getting good. So, number one, pick something very gif uh, difficult, get good at it. Number two, it has to affect people in a positive way. Did you pick a good profession? You bet you did. Now, my wife is a psychotherapist, so we both call ourselves in the helping professions. Uh, uh, my wife, Jana, there are people alive today because Jana was their psychotherapist. No kidding. She has gotten calls at 2 o'clock in the morning and answered calls and talked people out of killing themselves. There are people alive today because of psychotherapists like Jana. Do you have that same impact on people? Yes, you do, and you don't even realize it. Now, every once in a while you get in touch with, but most of the time we lead our lives, we lead our days not realizing the incredible impact you have or could have on students' lives. I can't tell you the number of times my wife, Jana, has told me stories that went something like this. You know, a client would say, without breaking confidence, she tells me these stories. A client will, a clients will say things like, if it weren't for school, I would not be here today. School was the only sane place in my life. Or more pointedly, if it weren't for Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so, I would not be here today. A teacher, a particular teacher. And she usually asks her clients, Had you, have you ever said that to Mr. or Miss So-and-so? And typically they haven't. So her homework is always track down Mr. or Miss So-and-so, you know, and say thank you. Now, how many have had people come back whom you've taught and say thank you? Just raise your hands. Just scan the room, please, just for a second. Just what a testament that is to the impact of your lives, that people come back after years and say thank you. They're usually driving a Mercedes, right? <laughs> They're dressed better than you are, right? And making more money than you are, right? And they'll say things like, Mr. So-and-so, Ms. So-and-so, thank you so much. It worked for you. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. And all you can remember is the kid was a pain in the neck the entire year. So that's kind of an object lesson. You don't know what's going on behind those eyes. You really don't. So the kid with his or her hands folded and legs crossed kind of staring you down, you might be rewiring their whole world and you just don't even realize it, and neither do they. So number one, pick something very difficult, get better at it. Number two, it has to affect people in a positive way. And number three, and this third part for me relates to the evaluation movement that's going on across the country. That is, you have to have the ability to be creative within it or have some autonomy over it, this thing that you pick. Can you make a link to teacher evaluation, administrator evaluation? And that is, if we have a system where you create a system that is a little checklist approach where everybody has to do things the same way, that's not it. First of all, the research doesn't support that. Second of all, we're going to lose our best people. So having some autonomy in it is very, very important. Now, I'm going to go back to that a couple of times in my presentation, those three things. Because I think what you're doing here actually fits the bill there. It really does. Your evaluation system actually helps people get better at a very, at a very complex thing and is designed to say, hey, if you're not great now, get great, and we're going to help you do it. By definition, it helps people, it affects people in a positive way. And then finally, it, uh, I forgot the third thing. Oh my God, what's the third thing? It was something really important. Hey, I'm, I'm 66, that's my only excuse. What was the third thing? Oh, it allows you to have some autonomy over it. So, changes are here, I realize that. And I realize this has been a tough year, I really do. And some of you, you know, have, uh, been misclassified in terms of your rankings. I realize that, and I'm sure my system has not helped to that effect. It really, it's not a simple system. It really isn't. And I apologize for that. But I do know this. Change is here, and it's not going to go away. And if you can just live through the tough times, okay, and build something that is powerful and actually helps people get better and is a fair system, you're going to change this country. And I don't say that lightly. I have worked in every state in this country at least three times over my career. I've never seen a profession like this, 
and I've never seen the focus like it is right now. This country is watching the state of Florida. No kidding. No kidding. And they're saying, let's see what happens there. Can we really, really pull this off? Now, it might be easy to get the perspective, well, it's the bad guys making this change. Now, this change is a legitimate change. It really is. Okay, I'm not saying we're doing it the best way possible, but it's a legitimate change. Now, I have to look over my shoulder here a little bit. Um, first of all, I believe that to be true. The old system just won't be tolerated. It really won't. The old days where teacher evaluation was a paper chase, fill out some forms and go, that's just not going to happen anymore. You know, and it shouldn't happen anymore. What we were doing made no sense at all. I'll try to show you that. Uh, various reports like, this isn't working real well. Uh, various reports like, I got two mics on? Okay. I'm good? Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Old feeble man needs to be helped here. Uh, various reports like race to the top, that, that's ch and, and, and race to the top, they've changed things dramatically. Uh, for example, uh, say various reports. Uh, there's a report called the widget effect, most administrators have read. A uh, report called rush to judgment, most administrators have read. Take a look at those things. And they're objective reports, they really are. And basically what they found when they looked at our evaluation system across the country is that no matter what the state Everybody got high ratings. Everybody. Do you realize most states in this country who have a, a four value rating system, 90 plus percent of the teachers from day one are in the top, top two categories? I really had no idea what I was doing when I was teaching. None at all. I had passion. I wanted to teach, but no pedagogical skill. I always got the highest ratings from day one. And from day one, I knew this makes no sense at all. I need help. And I knew this is a very difficult profession, and it takes a long time to get good. As a matter of fact, the experts in, the, in expertise have put a number on that. And you have one of the experts here at Florida State University, K. Anders Erickson, wonderful professor, I've never met him. He's been reading, excuse me, writing and researching expertise for decades. And he, and he talks about, although he didn't coin, what's called the 10-year rule. And here's what the 10-year rule is. It takes at least 10 years within a profession to become an expert, at least 10 years. How many 10-year or more veterans do we have here? Okay. Now, keep your hands up. This is the group from which your experts come. No offense to those with your hands raised. Just because you got your hand raised does not automatically make you an expert. What does? Well. 10 years of what they call deliberate practice. And here's what deliberate practice is. Identifying your weaknesses and getting a little bit better each year on a few of your weaknesses. Does this sound familiar? This is in fact what you're building into your evaluation system. That's unheard of. The old system was paper chase. You're a nice person. You're dedicated. You get high scores. In the new system, what it looks like is no. Let's be serious about where we are. And it's OK not to be good in the beginning. But we will help you get better. How's this doing here? This isn't working real well. <laughs> OK, characteristics of the old system. Uh, there was very little, if any, distinction uh, between teachers' levels of perform performance. Feedback to teachers was infrequent at a surface level. It wasn't designed to help teachers get better. Did not include student learning as a criterion. Uh, now, let's just, let me just pause here for a second. Uh, and that notion of uh, little distinction between teachers, just let me stay with that, because that's actually the thing that has got the public looking at our profession. They're saying, it doesn't make sense that everybody should have the highest scores. So let's just look at that logically for a second, it kind of impact, uh, it, it, with, with, without passion. And, uh, most states have a four-valued system, and I'll just use the terms unsatisfactory, developing, proficient, or in advanced. You have a slightly different system, but let's use those right now. Now, statistically, from a statistical perspective, logically, if, if in fact teaching is a, a, a complex field and teachers have a normal distribution in terms of their skill level, remember the old bell curve, yes? Okay, well, you, we've got 3.5 million teachers in this country. It makes sense that they probably form a normal distribution. Taking that into consideration, what would you expect the percentage of teachers to be at the highest level? You follow me? And I'm going to give you four choices here. 
7% is A, 16% is B, 20% is C, and 25% is D. Just turn to the person next to you. What would you guess? What would you guess? Okay, how many said A? How many said B? How many said C? How many said D? Statistically, it's A. Logically, you would assume not a whole lot of people at that top tier. You know, by definition, top two percentile points within any profession are the real experts in that profession. Now, remember human satisfaction? If we have a system where your first year, like me, you can get the highest rating, what does that say about human satisfaction? One of the most difficult professions in the world, yet I got the highest ratings right from day one. It made no sense at all. From one perspective, we're robbing ourselves, you know, of the challenge. Unfortunately, we have a profession where it goes something like this. If I get a low score, that's something wrong with me, as opposed to I'm at a certain level of development, and that's all it is. And what we rob ourselves of is the joy of getting to that high level after years. After years of what they call deliberate practice, and that is picking a few things to work on each year, getting a little better each year. Uh, so the answer from a statistical perspective is that. You know, it would, would look like that. Now, that's a normal distribution. That's not to say that school districts should not aspire to having to change that distribution, to actually having the majority of your people at the top end. And I know Leon County prides itself in that aspiration. That's good. Maybe you're there already. I don't know. If you're there already, it's pretty remarkable. Okay, but that's a normal distribution. Across the nation, that's what we'd expect, uh, expect across the state. That's what we'd, we'd expect. Come on. Uh, if you really wanted to be generous statistically, you could use the following percentages. But even that, you know, I would assert if a school district in this day and age or a state in this day and age had a teacher evaluation system with those numbers, they'd be in trouble. And for me, the ultimate challenge in terms of teacher evaluation and feedback and administrator evaluation and feedback is going to be, are we willing to live with the truth about how people are doing, or do we have to have a profession where you say, hey, everybody is good right from day one? That's the challenge. And I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. Because if we don't do that, public education is going to look very different, I would assert, 10 years from now. It'll be taken away. People will say, wait a minute, let's have a system that's more accurate uh, in nature. This isn't working at all. Okay, most educators intuitively recognize those facts. They really did. And that's why the system right now is under, it's, you know, it's under a siege. It really is. And from one perspective, rightfully so. People are saying, change this, make it accurate. Give us a system that works. Can you advance the slide just by using your finger? Uh, this isn't working very well. Much is happening across the country. Those are some of the big things. Discussions of merit pay are going on. More frequent and fine grade feedback to teachers. Inclusion of measures of student learning. That's a big change. It really is. It's a huge change. Now, just try to divorce yourself from being an educator right now. Turn to the person next to you and just answer this, not being part of the profession. To what extent do you think student learning should be part of the equation in terms of how teachers are doing? Just turn to the person next to you. What do you think? To what extent should it be part of the equation? Okay. How many said it should be included, but let's have a fair measure? And let me tell you something. Across the country, everybody realizes that. No kidding. Particularly the researchers and the statisticians. I keep very close to that literature. I know of no researcher, statistician who's saying a single measure should be the only thing that we use. That is changing. It will change, believe me. 
Okay, it's just not there right now. So if you can kind of live through the tough times here, what you're going to find is a system that does things like in, you know, it does things like include uh, student learning in the equation, but in a much fairer way. I know we're not there yet, and that's where we need some, that's why I make apologies. Uh, let's go to the ne next slide. Now, with all this big movement toward let's measure better, let's be more accountable, let's give teachers better feedback, we, people are realizing things. There's error in the system. There really is. We're just not there from a psychometric point of view. We're not precise enough, and it's going to take years to get as precise as we want. Uh, let's look at the, some of the imprecision, if you do the next slide. Um, the, uh, first of all, MET study. Uh, that's the measures of effective teaching. If you haven't looked at that, take a look at it sometime. It was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And here's what they found. No matter what the model used to measure teachers in the classroom, there's not a real strong correlation with what you get after four or five observations in actual student learning. People realize that. No kidding. So what's happening now are how do we develop systems to get better information? That's coming. And again, Florida's leading the country. Leon County is one of the districts leading Florida. The more you adapt your system to clean up some of the air, the better. And you're going that direction. Next slide, please. Um, you know, there's been air in the system forever. Just to make that point, we measure students each year, state tests. You measure them on teacher made tests. There's air in that system. There really is. Let's, let me look at the state test level. Um, next slide. Uh, Standardized test, a gentleman named Gregory Sizek. Next slide. Uh, researcher, strict researcher. You know, just objective. You know, I'm not. I'm an applied researcher. I try to translate everything. So I always come in with a bias. That's what you do when you're applied. Gregory Sizek's just strict researcher. Looks at tests, particularly large scale tests. Now, in a book, oddly enough, on formative assessment, he had a chapter on where do state tests fit into the grand scheme of things. And he just reported some numbers here. Kind of interesting. Now, he was a gentleman. He didn't say which Midwestern state it is. I, happen to th I think I know what it is. Uh, it was a, uh, talking about their math test then. And he just reported the reliability, which was 0.87. Do you remember reliabilities? They go from 0 to 1. Is that a good reliability? Yeah, the answer is. You get up about 0.8, and you're right there in the ballgame. You really are. No problem there. Look at the subscale scores, though. Remember what a subscale score is? That's when they break out the big overall score into these little finer grain silos, if you will. The reliability of those were 0.33, 2.57. Are those good reliabilities? No, they're not. They're way below the threshold. Next slide. Here's the scary part. The reliability of what they call different scores, that's zero. Zero. No reliability at all. 0 0.015. Now here's what a different score is. When you look, uh, let's say I'm in your class and you look at my scores on any state test or any standardized test, and you look at the subscale scores and you say, you know, based on these subscale scores, I'm going to work with Bobby on this, not this. You follow me? That's a different score. The reliability of that is a zero. Okay, let me show you what Sizek says about this. Look at the next slide. For those in back who can't read it, I will. It might be, the, uh, uh, might be that the dependability of conclusions about different scores uh, is nearly zero. In many cases, a teacher who flipped a coin to decide whether to provide the pupil with focused intervention in algebra or measurement would be making a decision about as accurately as the teacher who relied on the examination of subscale differences for the two areas. You see what he's saying? Now, by the way, if you do that now, notice I said individual students, not the class. If you're doing that for the class, the reliability is not zero. So keep doing that. But individual students, it's zero. We need more information, which is the mantra of measurement people. If you're not sure, we need more information from different sources. Okay, let me go to, next slide, let me go to a, a basic equation here and explain this because we're talking a lot about measuring teachers. We've always talked about measuring students. We're talking about measuring administrators now. That's the basic equation of what they call classical test theory. Here's what it says. Any score that you receive, that's your observed score, has two parts to it. One part's the true score. That's what you truly deserved. But there's error built into that. Now, this, is, this, this, this applies to anything. The Olympics, when they score the, gym, the gymnast, that's the observed score. Their true score is what they really deserve. Uh, ever watch an event and get really angry? 
you know, because the scores were too high or too low. Because you're, you're saying the true score wasn't that, it was something else. In the Olympics, actually, with uh, uh, gymnastics, they dropped the high and the low in an in effort to get to that true score. Now, let, let me play this out a little bit. Let's say I'm in your class and I get a, you, you give me a test. I get a score of 70 on that test. That's my observed score. Unless my true score was 75. How can that happen? I got a 70. I should have got a 75. Can you see what was a time test? I didn't get to some items. Or you didn't score all my items correctly. You didn't give me some points I should have had. Or I don't know, when I was teaching, am I the only one who did this? I always scored my test at night after a glass of wine. Am I the only one who did that? <laughs> And if, you, and if it was a particularly bad day, it was two glasses of wine. If you were down at the bottom of the pile, it might have been something like, okay, let's see how she does, little smarty pants. Smirk at me. Let me see how many points you get on this sucker, okay? That type of thing. That's error working against you. How about the other way around? I got a 70. I should have got a 65. How can that happen? I got lucky, I guessed. Or my favorite comic, uh, Elaine Boozer, had a whole uh, routine she used to do on high school math tests. She said she hated those math tests where you had two pieces of paper. On one piece of paper, you put your answer. The other piece of paper, you put how you got your answer. She said on the second piece of paper, she would always have to draw a picture of herself looking at the kid's paper next to her. That's, that's error working for you, all right? Uh, now, let me, let me play this out. A bunch of numbers here, let me explain them. This is classroom teacher's tests, okay? These are your tests. See that first row? See the first column? where it says rel.45, that's the reliability, okay? Now, by the way, that 0.45, that is the typical reliability of a teacher test. You follow me? So when you, the night before, put a test together, most likely you got about a 0.45 reliability. Looks kind of bad, doesn't it? But actually, let me put it in perspective. How, can, how many can remember the previous slide that said the, that talked about the reliabilities of the subscale scores in your state test? They were from what? 0.33 to 0.57. Different way of looking at it. The typical teacher-made test is about as reliable, reliable as your subscale scores on a state test. Puts it in a whole different light. Now look at the second column there. It says 70. That's the observed score. Look at the next two columns. Those are what they call the 95% confidence interval. An interval of scores in which you're 95% sure the true score falls. Can you get the picture here? Just scroll down. Reliability of 0.45, you give Bobby a 70, but you're 95% sure my true score is anywhere from a 52 to an 88. Let's go to the highest reliability you're going to get with a common assessment, maybe 0.85. You give a kid a 70, and you're 95% sure the true score is from a 60 to an 80. Do you get my point? We live in an imprecise profession. So when you get upset about being misclassified, that's unfortunate. Hopefully, we would always have the true score. But that is just going to happen. And we do it with kids all the time. It's just part of our profession. So you can kind of live with that you know, and just work to change, get more accurate and more accurate. And there are ways of doing that with a teacher evaluation. I, I used to think, boy, we live in a profession here where it's just so imprecise. I wish I was in the hard sciences. See, the soft sciences are education, psychology, sociology. You know, we're not measuring things that you can see. We're measuring what's in kids' heads and their personalities. You know, hard sciences, they measure, you know, speed of things and size of things. And, you know, I thought, well, medicine, that, what, that, what, that's a hard science. They measure things and they're right on. You know, why can't we be like that? Well, maybe they have a little bit of slop in the system, too. Measurement, by definition, maybe is a little imprecise. Uh, true story. If you go for a walk with me, you'll notice I have a bit of a limp. Here's why. Five years ago, I had my right hip replaced. You, you, you get old, the parts start wearing out. That's just what happens, okay? So I had my right hip replaced. And right away, I said to the doctor, I said, you know, this leg, my right leg, feels longer than the left leg. And he says, no, that's because we made some inc inc incisions and cut a lot of tendons, et cetera, et cetera. Just growing back, it'll get better. Two months go by, three months go by, six months go, go by, and I still feel like it's longer. I said, let's measure. Now, it took me three months to get different measurements, to get the accurate measure, an inch and a quarter difference. So my right leg, after the surgery, was one inch and a quarter longer than the left leg. And I said to the doctor, who was well known, I won't tell you his name, but he was very well known in Denver, where I live. I said, doctor, how could this happen? This is a direct quote. He said, Bob, it's not a precise science, direct quote. 
and it just blew me away, you know? And I remember thinking, well, if it's a, not a precise science to cut your femur off and hammer in a spike with a new titanium, maybe we should lighten up a little bit on the precision we, ex you see where I'm going here? It's just the nature of the beast, the nature of the beast. So we're living in an imprecise world. Please, nobody's trying to be mean if you get misclassified. That's just the way it is right now, and it's an unfortunate thing. By the way, there is a good ending to the story. My right leg was so much longer than my left. My left hip wore out, so I had to have my left hip replaced a year ago, where they put another inch on this side, so I'm an inch taller than I've ever been in my life. There you go. Two more of these, and I'm going to start my basketball career, and Superintendent Pons, a basketball coach, I'll, I'll, I'll go to him. Uh, let's move on here. Okay, now, this, is, this change is massive. You're right in the beginning of it, in second-order change. That's what they call massive change. It's by definition chaotic. It really is. It just happens that way. So here's Bob's predictions. Who knows if I'm right? I think you'll see this. Merit pay will look different from what is currently being discussed. It's a logical idea, but I, we're not there yet. People realize we're just not precise, so kind of have to live with some wiggle in the system. I think feedback to teachers will become more efficient and more accurate. I think measures of student learning will include multiple types of assessment that are closer to the classroom. And some of this stuff you can start doing right now, absolutely right now on an informal basis. And teacher growth will be formally acknowledged and rewarded. And that's a big one. Actually, not to just say, Here's where you stand in the distribution, therefore we'll reward you if you're over here and not over here. We'll say, we want to see how much you've gained. That is a huge, that is a sea change in and of itself. Let's move on here. Uh, these changes are going to take time. They really, will. they really will. So what do we do? Well, some things we can do right now. I'll read these to you in back. So here's your options. Take people like Marzano out behind the barn and punch his lights out. Oh, there's We'll vote on this in a little bit. Wait for the current teacher evaluation movement to fade away and die. Okay, stand back and criticize current efforts. Four, usually when I've had people vote, this is the favorite one. Do one, two, and three simultaneously. Or four, start developing the next generation of teacher evaluation systems right now. Now, I was actually stupid enough to have people vote when I did this once, and so my, 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 thin is not, my skin is not strong, thick enough to handle that. I, my guess is some of you would vote, a few of you may vote for five. How many would vote for five? Let's do that. Very good, okay, nice choice, nice choice. Next slide, next slide. Uh, now, I really mean it, this is the beginning I know if you sit in a classroom, you think this is the end. This is going to be imposed on me. This is so malleable, it's ridiculous. The only thing that's not going to change is that it's not going to go back to the old, that is not subject to change, is that we're not going to go back to what way it was before. This is wide open. And I'm so sincere about the country is watching Florida, no kidding, you know, and lead districts like yourself. You got great leadership here. For me, where we are right now, now, some distinctions should be made, and I think this is a big one, and that is the distinction between what's the primary purpose of your evaluation system? Is it for teacher measurement or is it for teacher development? And those are two very different things. And actually, as you look at the literature, you see both of these talk talked about. The early discussions about changing teacher evaluation really started with, well, we've got to be more accurate, kind of the accountability function. They, it soon morphed within a couple of years to say, wait a minute, we want to have a system that actually grows great teachers because we realize this is a very, very difficult profession, very, very complex. Just to put it, you know, how complexity being an expert. Uh, I mentioned Kanders Erickson, great uh, professor here at Florida State University. Uh, he was one of the first people to write, you know, widely about this thing called the 10-year rule, how long it takes to become an expert. And he gave us some, some feel for what experts are like in any complex profession. They started with chess. I, apparently it's easy to study because very concrete thing. Here's what they did. They estimated that a chess master has anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 moves in their head. Now, I don't know how they came up with that number, but they came up with that's a big number. The chess master sees the board differently than you or I. They see all the possibilities, 50,000 to 100,000. Let's talk about the expert teachers among us now. Does the expert te do the expert teachers among us have 50,000 to 100,000 moves in their head when they walk into the classroom. I don't know if it's that many, but it's a lot, correct? And I see teachers every week, virtually. I watch videotape literally every single week. 
because that's how we do our research. So I'm always in a classroom. And boy, it is so obvious. The novice, like me when I started, has a couple of ways of doing a thing. The experts, like many of you out there, have, talk about the same thing. They'll have 30 ways of doing it. And they will make instructional decisions. Some people say every minute. There's been studies on this. At first, I thought that was kind of crazy. No, not every minute, until I started sitting down with teachers, watching videotapes of themselves. And I would say, so why did you do that? Why did you do that? Why did you do that? And it was literally about every minute. And it's interesting. The novice would say, well, I'm, I don't know. You know, I kind of always do that. The expert would say, well, here's why I did that particular thing. And it's incredibly nuanced. No kidding. An expert among us, watch the videotape of him or her, you see that person lean in to one student, pat him or her on the shoulder, you know, while they're talking, you know, smiling. Uh, n next student, lean in, smile, but don't pat the student on the shoulder. And if you ask that teacher, so with this student, why did you lean in and pat the student on the shoulder and the student you didn't, you would get an answer. And the answer might go something like this. Well, with Bobby here, I kind of got into it with him yesterday. We just want to let him know, hey, I'm still on your side. Okay, had to sanction you. Hey, we're, some, you know, we're together, don't worry. This student here, different culture. Had I broken a certain barrier, that would have put him, you follow me? It's these nuanced decisions that just happen. So, uh, development takes a long time. And therefore, a system, an evaluation system designed to help teachers get better, be, be one that is very, very nuanced, that has a lot of pieces and parts. Now, the system you pick, and I'm incredibly honored, you pick my system to take and adapt and make it your own. It has a lot of moving parts, right? You might have looked at it the first time and said, look at all of this stuff. You know, and there is a lot of stuff. That's because it's a complex thing. It really is, this thing called being an effective teacher. Now, for me, when you start down this journey, which you already have, you had no choice in that, creating a different evaluation system, you have to look at what's our major purpose here. Is it to measure or is it to develop? So here's a little artificial scale. We'll do a little vo a, a poll here, see where you are. Um, if you think that measuring teachers is the only purpose of teacher evaluation, you'd score yourself a one. You with me? Got to move a body part when I ask a question. Okay, yes? Uh, if you think that uh, developing teachers is the only purpose for teacher evaluation, it's a five. If you think it's half and half, half of uh, the purpose of the teacher evaluation should be half measurement and half uh, development, then it's a three. If you say two, both are important, but measurement is more important. If you say four, both are important, but development is more important. Turn to the person next to you. What would you vote for there? Where would you put yourself in the scale? Okay, let's see what we got. How many would score yourself a one? Measurement is the only purpose. That's interesting, I've never had an educator score it a one. How many would score a two? Both are important, but measurement is more important. Okay, it's usually small, but how many would score it a three? It's half and half. How many would score it a four? How many would score it a five? And the winner is a four. You're saying both are important, and development is more important, at least for now, at least for now. And that is across the country people think that. So what would it look like if we did that? And what you're gonna find, the answer to that is a lot of what you're doing right now. So let me give you a couple of recommendations. Let's move to the next one, let's go after that. Where do we start? One more. For now, keep, uh, keep the focus on development, which is happening here in Florida and it starts this next year, correct? You actually start the development phase how do we uh, look at teachers' growth? We start that next year. Unprecedented. We've never done that before. Next slide. Okay, major emphasis of both supervision and evaluation should be development. Let's keep going. Now, to be real specific to Florida, this is the model race to the top states are using. In evaluating teachers, it's gonna be 50% student learning and 50% teacher uh, pedagogical skill. 
Okay, now, they're, they're debating that those numbers have changed too. Let me show you what Florida is doing. I, I hope you know this. If you don't, it's going to be important. Let's take a look at this. Next one, next one. I don't know why this thing isn't working. Uh, at least as originally planned, the teacher status score is going to be part, the teacher instruction score is going to be part how well you're doing on those elements within the model. The other part is going to be teacher development, how much you grow over time. And I've said it a couple times now, that is a massive change. Do you realize the message that's sending? It's saying, look, you might not be that skilled in the beginning, and that's okay. A certain amount of skill is required. But you can walk in, a certain amount of skill, still lacking in many areas. But if you get better every year, you know, we'll help you and we'll grow you to any level you want. Now, that's a massive change. Let's move on. Uh, now, don't expect every teacher to be good in everything right away. Now, remember the three things required to have a satisfied life. One is autonomy over it, the ability to be creative within it. That speaks directly to it. Everybody doesn't have to be good in everything because experts aren't good in every element of any model. They pick certain things that they're going to focus on. Now, your model has that built into it. It really does. Uh, if you go to the next slide, can't see this very well. Um, let me read it to you in back. Uh, those are the categories of the Florida system. Look at highly effective. You, 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 know, you know what I mean by domain one? Yes? OK, I'm sure you do. If you look at the requirements, here's what it's saying. There are certain areas you could be horrible at or not do at all and still be effective. Do you get the message? The message says, hey, we realize this is something that's personal to you. And you're going to have certain strengths and certain weaknesses. And it's OK. We will go that route with you. There are teachers who produce great results and don't use all elements of the model. Of course. Are there teachers who produce great results and actually violate some elements of the model? Yes, there are. Now, by the way, in general, highly effective teachers do more of the same than they do differently. But every once in a while, you have a rogue or two, and you know who you are. Some of you are out there right now who actually do some things that are counterintuitive and still produce results. Your system allows for that. It really does. It's not a checklist approach. Here's my favorite story of a teacher who produced great results but was a bit of a rogue. Happened to be a high school social studies teacher, tended to lecture a lot. That's not horrible, but that's not all you wanted. Tended to sit on a stool. That's not horrible, but it's not great. Here's the part that would raise your eyebrows. He ordered his class in terms of their rank in class. Okay, so here's the way it went. Uh, student right over there was the number one student in class. This row over here, which by the way he called skid row, so this is not a research-based strategy I'm recommending. <laughs> and the student way over there was the last student. They say, oh my god, give him the hook. It worked for him. And here's why. He made it a game. Every day he would come in, and you could go from the last seat to the first seat. You know, he would ask a question. He'd think he fudged a little bit, too. He'd say, who wants to knock off Miss Smarty Pants? She's been in there for four days. Okay, and you'd switch seats. Now again, I'm not recommending that as a technique, but it worked for him, and here's what I mean that it worked. Kids loved him, they loved social studies, and they could knock the socks off of any test that you gave them. You get the idea? So you have a system that allows for that. It allows you to excel in certain areas and not even do others. That's a change, that's a massive change, it really is. Uh, a couple more recommendations. Uh, consider different levels of expertise. This is massive, too. I know you know this, maybe you haven't thought through it. In the state of Florida, what you're considering and starting to implement is not grading all teachers on the same scale. Depending on your level of experience, you have different criteria. Let's go through those really fast. A couple slides here. This was the one to three year teacher. If you could see domain one, you'd see to be highly effective certain numbers there. Next slide. This is the four to ten year teacher. Now it increases a little bit. Next slide. This is the, but beyond 10 years, a different set of criteria. That's the same. Wait a minute. We don't expect the same things from beginning teachers to mid-career teachers to teachers who have been in the profession for a long time. Massive, powerful message. This is, I know it looks like it sometimes, this is not something that was designed to make your life more miserable, even though parts of it do, does. It was actually designed something to be more fair. It really was. And there's a lot of flexibility in it. 
Turn to the person next to you, react to this piece. Different teachers of, at different levels of experience evaluated with different criteria. Good idea or bad idea, what do you think? Okay, come on back. One more recommendation. Next slide. Here's what you do right now. Start experimenting with multiple ways of getting information about teachers in your classroom. I know now you have observations. Everybody realizes, hey, might misclassify you. They're just errors in the system. Next slide. Let me show you some ways people are, are talking about. Alternate measures of teacher's evaluation, along with your unannounced observations. Those should be there. But how about things like teacher, se no, go back, uh, teacher self-evaluation? Well, here's what some places, they're saying, look, let's start with teacher's own evaluation, where they think they are, you know, and start with that. It's kind of a reference point. If you are scored lower than where you think, uh, higher than where you think you are, what that usually says is, hey, the teacher probably knows his or her skill more than anybody else. If your score is exactly the same, Pretty solid evidence. The only part that wouldn't work real well is if you, you score yourself real high, everybody else scores you low. What happens then, you say, okay, provide some evidence for that. Or how about unannounced observations? Most of you are familiar with the model. You know our three types of lessons? Remember the content? Lessons with new knowledge, lessons for deepening knowledge, lessons for applying knowledge. Some places are saying, let's have three announced observations. So we ask teachers, hey, Show me a lesson where you're introducing new knowledge. Let's take a look at that. I'll be in three weeks later. Show me this type of lesson. Show more information. Uh, getting all the way down to teacher-generated evidence for specific values. Where you say, I, I'm a three. I provide evidence for that three. Now, it's changing. It's dramatically changing. It really is. Again, I apologize for the angst in your life, the confusion. You know, I know it's my system. It's not the easiest to do. Please remember this. You do make a huge difference in people's lives. No kidding. You picked a great profession. Uh, I once heard Jane Goodall speak, and she just she said something. Just you know, Jane Goodall, the primate lady. I expected her to talk about primates. She talked about life in the world, and she said something. I just maybe it was how she said it, but it just hit me. She said, "A human being cannot go through a day." without impacting other people's lives, either positively or negatively, by what you do and what you don't do. And I immediately thought of teachers. Multiply that by 100. No kidding. When your kids come, by, come back, every day you interact with kids. You cannot help but, but impact their lives, either positively or negatively, by everything you do and everything you don't do. What an incredible responsibility on one hand. What an incredible opportunity on the other. And don't forget my wife's stories, no kidding. There are kids that will never smile at you to make your day bad systematically, whose lives you are changing. If you could keep that in your hip pocket, I think we would get up every day a little teary-eyed at the incredible profession you've chosen. So thanks for choosing that profession, really. Thank you very much. Thanks for using my model. You know, I hope it, it serves you. Please feel free to change it. Make it work, okay? But lead this change, lead this change. Thank you very much.